Chapter Fourteen of A Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ruhi Huck. Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square by Mrs. Henry de la Pasture. Chapter Fourteen The Duke until he was nineteen or twenty years old the duke of monaghan had lived the life of a recluse less perhaps because his health had latterly required such complete seclusion than because it was difficult to shake off the compulsory habits of invalidism formed during the earlier years of his boyhood the dukedom had descended upon his father almost as unexpectedly as the fortune of miss marney upon louise de Corset the distant cousin whom the late duke had succeeded having a large family of daughters for whom he was naturally desirous to make every provision in his power left as little as he could help to his heir-at-law and consequently denis was in proportion to his rank a poor man it had therefore been impressed upon him from his earliest youth by his mother that if he married at all he must marry money the duke had smiled a melancholy smile at the very notion of marriage but he was fully alive nevertheless to the embarrassment of his poverty with a number of people dependent upon him a large landed estate which brought in next to no profit and a magnificent castle tumbling into ruins for want of the necessary repairs the duchess had been a west country heiress and had a large fortune of her own but she spent her income royally and as the capital was tied up on her second son dermot it would not benefit the duke nor his impoverished irish estate she rented a house in park lane spent the autumn in scotland the winter in her home on the borders of devon and somerset and the spring in the south of france but she never went to ireland if she could help it and when her son visited kilmore he was obliged to visit it alone it was with extreme reluctance and at the insistence of his guardians that the duchess permitted her invalid son over whom she had maintained complete control for twenty years to quit her maternal care and go to oxford but perhaps she had as his guardians believed over doctored the duke oppressed his spirits and retarded his recovery by her constant and arbitrary supervision for the remarkable improvement which took place in his health undoubtedly dated from the beginning of his college career his melancholy lessened he began to find it possible to be interested even in the sports he could never hope to join his natural abilities which were considerable were called into play he perceived that it was open to him to distinguish himself if he would among his fellows in spite of his lameness he had been educated of course entirely at home but his tutor had been a wise and learned german a master of languages and a fine musician he had directed and formed the boy's tastes for reading encouraged his love of music and laid the foundations upon which denis presently based the structure of a very creditable university career shaking the yoke of his mother's authority off his long-suffering shoulders the duke spent his vacations abroad at first with his old tutor in anxious attendance but later with younger and more cheerful companions he found himself to his astonishment able to live much as they lived though his lameness naturally precluded him from sharing their more active exercises but he studied music with enthusiasm and became familiar with the art galleries of europe when he left oxford he proceeded to visit his neglected estates in ireland but here disappointment and disillusion awaited him nothing could be done without money and of money he had none and next to none as soon as the accumulations of his minority were at his disposal which was not according to his father's will until he was five-and-twenty he did what he could which was something and dreamed of doing more the careless luxury of the expenditure in park lane angered him when he thought of the silent deserted and almost ruined halls of his predecessors 
concerning his feelings for his mother denis dwelt upon them as little as possible he was not in sympathy with her and she resented what she believed to be his ingratitude probably it was rather his independence that she resented having grown accustomed to settle everything for her eldest son to have him always under her own eye and to consider him as helpless as an infant she did not relish his sudden emancipation and found his restoration to health irksome in fact though in theory she was obliged to rejoice nevertheless she respected denis she knew him to be steady and high principled as his brothers were wild careless and extravagant and she wished him to marry with all her heart she was becoming indeed somewhat feverishly anxious upon the subject and unlike the generality of mothers was prepared to welcome almost any young woman whom her son might select provided only that she had a fair fortune on this point the duchess was firm though her own parentage was unexceptionable or perhaps because of this fact she was not painfully exclusive in principle she was not of those who are the bane of the newly rich and the successfully married unimpressed by present appearances searching for humble pasts preferably ignored and crying always but who was she on the contrary the only question that vexed her economic soul was how much let her be respectable and not smart let her but have a dot sufficient to set them up in comfort and i care nothing who she may be thought the duchess but it was her despair that the duke did not seem inclined to marry at all she had never been of a demonstrative nature and the petting and coaxing which had been bestowed upon the crippled boy had come from his attendants and not from his mother whom he had rather feared than loved his affection had been for his father who passionately regretful of the misfortune which had befallen his heir had lavished upon him every indulgence in his power the duke's death crushed the spirits of the little invalid and made him grave and melancholy beyond his years but in proportion to the deprivations of his boyhood did the young man now enjoy the existence which his brothers appeared to devoid of amusement and excitement it was not considered prudent that he should hunt but he rode in moderation and walked as much as his lameness permitted and the exercise increased his strength he lost the air of almost ethereal delicacy which constant confinement had bestowed and though he must always be delicate looked and was perfectly healthy and well his brothers loved him sincerely but pitied him more for a man who could neither hunt play cricket nor go deer stalking must be always in their opinion an object of pity from the sports and games that were at this period of their lives the salt of their existence he was for ever debarred and though they were accustomed to his exclusion from their favourite pursuits they were sorry for him whenever they remembered it they were rough good-hearted young fellows with a strain of their mother's overbearing disposition in their natures which may have accounted for their quarrels with their surviving parent and with each other but with denise they never quarrelled partly because of his own gentleness and partly because in their frequent scrapes he always shielded and sympathised with them since for so many years his spirit had chafed under the knowledge of his own utter helplessness and dependence it afforded him indeed special satisfaction to be of use to them and to others and he assumed his position as head of the house with an almost pathetically earnest determination to do his duty therein thus rejoicing in his newly acquired freedom he was divided between amusement and disgust when his mother with tears in her eyes recommended to him one nice kind motherly young creature with money after another as exactly formed to take care of him and watch over his valuable health it was the helplessness the timidity the childishness of little jean that had touched him during the ridiculous episode of her unauthorized call upon one of the most conventional women in london the young man's heart still leapt to recall the look she had cast upon him the appeal for help in her beautiful frightened brown eyes the glad relief and gratitude of the little dimpling face when he had cast his shyness to the winds 
and came to her assistance the flush of joy when he boldly claimed kinship and the right to show in some measure the sympathy and interest with which his heart was filled at the mere touch of the magic wand of first love for though he was five and twenty years old and had loved innumerable heroines of history and fiction and imagination and even a few never to be forgotten but personally nearly unknown goddesses in real life yet denise knew almost the instant that he had set eyes upon jeanne that here was his first and last and only love having looked upon himself pensively for some years past as one wedded to his art alone he was the more taken aback by the strength and suddenness of his passion and inclined to ridicule himself for the discovery that the conditions of a man's life even though he may have spent an invalid boyhood are not necessarily fixed and unchangeable at the age of twenty-five but every day his love took a stronger hold of him in defiance of ridicule or bewilderment he thought of his brothers who had been in and out of half a dozen love affairs already quite unknown to the duchess and who remained apparently perfectly cheerful and heart whole in spite of these experiences he thought of his poverty of his mother's certain indignation for though her brother might be rich jean herself so far as he knew had not a penny in the world of the absolute necessity of his marrying money if he married at all of the wisdom of remaining as he was and allowing his wealthy brother dermot to succeed him and the upshot of all his reflections was after nearly a week's indecision that he determined to remain in london for the present instead of returning to ireland and to call at ninety nine grosvenor square again upon the very first opportunity that should present itself during this week time hung less heavily than usual upon jeanne's hands for she had found an occupation she worked at her french for a couple of hours every morning under the guidance of the old professor sent to her by the duke of monaghan and in the afternoon prepared diligently long exercises for his inspection on the morrow so delighted was she with her own progress that she even began to indulge in dreams of a translation of cyrano de bergerac as a triumphant surprise wherewith to greet her brother on his return but at present she contented herself with choosing his favourite work for the daily reading which was to improve her accent and extend her acquaintance with the language at the end of the week cecilia appeared very smartly dressed in scarlet cloth and white fox a combination eminently becoming to her fair skin and golden hair though qualified to render the stoutness of her figure yet more conspicuous well you dear thing you have never asked me to drive as you promised so i have come to look you up what do you think joseph has been telegraphed for to berlin and has gone off at a moment's notice i cannot make up my mind whether to follow him or not has he gone for a long time that is just it that is my dilemma he was in one of his moods when he went away and would not give me an idea how long he was likely to be if i pack up and follow him he may be starting home just as i arrive and i should have the journey for nothing he played that trick on me once before and if i put off going why he may stay on and on and i be missing all sorts of functions to which they would be obligated to invite me if i were with him what would you advise i would do what he wished of course said jeanne bluntly it is all very well for you to say that but a married woman knows very well that it does a man no good to spoil him he would not thank her if she did said cecilia peevishly wait till you have a husband of your own my dear a propos have you seen anything of our little friend the duke jeanne coloured rather angrily at the tone in which cecilia pronounced these words but a certain embarrassment made her glad to be able to answer she had not seen her cousin since the night of the little dinner do you mean to say that after dining here he has not called said cecilia with exaggerated surprise how very rude i do not see that it is rude my dear you own yourself that you are quite unacquainted with la convenance said cecilia with dignity it is usual to leave cards at least after dining but you and the professor have not left cards cried jeanne cecilia recollected herself in some confusion 
that is quite different i have known you all your life one does not stand on ceremony with old friends you know perhaps relations do not stand on ceremony either my dear he is the most distant cousin in the world i have been looking him up and it was three generations ago that one of them married a marney of orset i had not meant to boast of it said jean colouring i know it is very distant oh you need not apologise said cecilia more good-naturedly if i were related to a duke however distantly i should take just as much care it was known as you do yourself and you have more reason to care about it than i having relations at what might one call the other end of the social scale in this delicate manner cecilia strove to remind jean of the existence of her uncle roberts the farmer yes i looked the duke up and i was surprised to find how old he was he is six and twenty i took him for the merest boy i suppose we fair-haired folk have a knack of looking younger than we really are jean endeavoured to turn the conversation by admiring cecilia's dress which indeed was a very striking and elegant cut it is not a bad little frock said mrs hogg watson as carelessly as though she had been all her life accustomed to wearing two thousand franc gowns from the maison doucet one might be tidy for london you know otherwise i never worry about my clothes though i am so particular about the children's i hope the children are well oh they are always well or if they are not they have the best of nurses to look after them what have you here exercises books you sly thing you are studying to fit yourself for anything that may turn up well this is foresight indeed i am improving my french to please louise to please louise indeed seriously jean you might be a little more open with such an old friend but however i will not press you i am the last person to force a confidence only i know the world better than you do perhaps i ought to utter a word of warning his brother lord dermot liscarney has the reputation of being a dreadful flirt and i have no doubt this young man is just the same don't make too sure even though of course your position is very different from what it used to be for i suppose louise could hardly refuse to make some kind of a settlement upon you so devoted as you have always been still a duke is a duke and not very likely to marry out of his own sphere after an ineffectual effort to persuade her friend to accompany her on a shopping expedition mrs hogg watson at length took her leave without waiting for tea and jean felt as the door closed behind her that there were after all worse things than solitude in this world she had scarcely recovered her equanimity when the duke walked into the room an hour ago she would have welcomed him with unaffected joy but now her greeting was so constrained that he could not but observe the alteration in her manner something has been vexing you cousin jean he said in his peculiarly gentle tones may i know what it is you have no bad news i hope jean shook her head no i have no news at all in my last letter he had just left obia so he must now as he said be marching towards me she hesitated a moment and then said cecilia has just been here oh said the duke so expressively that jean smiled feeling more at ease you do not like her i can believe that a prolonged tete-a-tete -tete with her might be rather trying said the duke who was too polite to own that he disliked any one far less a lady whom he had met under jean's own auspices she says such things faltered jean petulantly then do not let your mind dwell on the things she says he said rather hurriedly some people say impossible things it is a kind of habit and the only way to avoid being ruffled is to think of something else how do you like my old professor he is the kindest old man in the world she said and denise smiled to see how easily her thoughts were diverted from her vexation and do you know he has promised to write to a friend of his who used to live in paris but he is not quite sure if he is still alive and make inquiries for me about the poor de Corset, who was killed in the south african war but it does not sound very hopeful said the duke unable to help smiling again 
i know his ways poor fellow he would be quite satisfied to wait a year or two for an answer from the possibly deceased friend there are quicker methods of research than his if you would care to employ them i will help you with all my heart oh thank you cousin denise i do long to find out would it not be delightful if louise and i discovered some near relations of our own i have always wished to belong to a family and it would make our french descent seem so much more real louis used to plan that directly he could afford it he and i were going to france to look for the chateau de courset and to try and find our relatives then might he not be a little disappointed to find we had forestalled him since he's coming home so soon i never thought of that said jean to be sure he would for louis likes to do things himself and we could start off together if i waited till he came home then perhaps it would be wiser to leave the inquiries in the professor's hands for the present where i believe they will be quite safe and perfectly stationary i think it would she was obliged to own and at least if i go on with my french i shall be able to talk to my family when i do find them which i certainly could not do at present you do not despise us for having french blood do you i have no insular prejudices i hope said the duke laughing i cannot understand any one's not being proud of the people who belong to them said jean of course it is more romantic if they are also a noble race she said flushing proudly is it snobbish to say so no indeed he said simply it is to me quite absurd to confound snobbishness with pride of race to be glad you are born of men and women who have for generations been distinguished for gallantry cultivation fine persons or that gentleness which is the only true gentility in mere common sense you could no more despise such a pedigree than a racing man despises the pedigree of a horse snobbishness to my mind consists in bearing one's self with more consideration towards one class of person than towards another whereas the well-bred man would be equally courteous and well-behaved she listened very earnestly yes do you know cousin denise you talk a little like louise only more more deliberately louise hurries out his words like a torrent but your ideas are very like his i do not profess to have originated them they were the merest platitudes he said with that look of affectionate raillery she had learned to associate with his gentle semi-ironical tones but it makes it plain said jean proudly that the truly noble man could not be ashamed of the people who belonged to him because they were with a sudden reminiscence of cecilia at the other end of the social scale in a way i am as proud of uncle roberts because he is so absolutely upright and independent and because i knew he would not do a wrong thing knowingly or stoop to flatter anybody to save his life as i am of any of my brave french ancestors though he is a rough and homely man so you should be he said with instant and warm approval oh cousin denise i remember a little girl who went to school with me in the village at the penny vaughan she was very clever and won scholarships and became a teacher and we heard that she passed her own father who was a labourer in the streets of Trego and would not recognize him she was ashamed of him i cried when i heard it but i was younger then and cried very easily i suppose it seemed so dreadful yes it was dreadful and still more dreadful to think of that girl being a teacher simply because she had passed a certain examination and at an age when the realities of life are mere words and experience and wisdom almost nil said denis rather sadly i have wondered sometimes why poor ladies do not turn their attention to village schools it would surely be a happier life than governessing or companioning cross old women and living in other people's houses the schoolmistress at penny one gets eighty pounds a year said jean she could rent a cottage and garden for four or five pounds and would have the dearest little home in the prettiest country in the world i suppose she could live on that said the duke who was not a practical housekeeper 
jeanne who was opened her eyes in astonishment if she couldn't live on thirty shillings a week and put by she said indignantly she would be a very helpless creature cousin denise don't you think i am rather ignorant of such details he confessed but only too eager to learn and i was thinking principally of the children they are so easily influenced at that age and would learn so quickly to distinguish between being genteel and gentle and thus discover the piteous vulgarity of pretence which is the terrible stumbling block in this country the only thing is said jeanne thoughtfully whether a lady would not be too finicking to care to do for herself he fathomed her meaning with an effort if she were fine he said rather disdainfully she would not belong to the class from which i would have her taken fineness is the characteristic of the middle classes the upper and lower are naturally destitute of it and that is why they usually sympathize when they meet yes i see what you mean a queen can sit and talk to an old peasant woman quite simply and without affection but that is because each knows her place in the world and has no occasion for pretence whereas the burgomaster's wife would make the peasant and the queen feel very uncomfortable he said laughing i do not know what a burgomaster's wife is well the mayor's lady the butcher's wife at trego is the worst said jeanne gravely she has a door knocked out in the back wall because she would not be seen coming out of her own shop they had tea together in the twilight for the days were now beginning to lengthen and after tea the duke played to jeanne and she sat by the fire and dreamt of louis and of the changes of that his return must ensure would not he leave the army now that he was so rich he must surely have done his share of soldiering but she had not dared to suggest this course to him in her letters perhaps he would buy back if it were possible the old french property in the boulogne as they talked of doing long ago in their childish plans together perhaps for mr valentine had hinted that this too lay within the power of the great fortune miss marney had bequeathed to louis he would rebuild orset and settle down in the west country would he be very much altered his letters did not seem to suggest it though she was conscious of more reserve in them than formerly he spoke less of himself and his wishes and his plans for the future and more of his work she thought and thought of louise but of her cousin denise playing softly in the firelight on poor miss marney's new piano beneath her old gilt harp she scarcely thought at all his perfect self-possession and friendliness had banished altogether the embarrassment which cecilia's insinuations had provoked she rested contentedly in his presence and enjoyed his companionship with all the gratitude that the remembrance of her loneliness before his advent could inspire he longed yet feared to disturb this happy unconsciousness it is too soon thought the duke but he too was dreaming of happiness to come as he played on and on in the warm spring-scented room and watched the pointed shadows cast by her downcast black lashes upon jeanne's face which glowed in the clear red light of the dying fire End of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of The Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ruhi Huck. The Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square by Mrs. Henry de la Pasture. Chapter Fifteen. The Bush Desert but my heart will still be with you wherever you may go can you look me in the face and say the same she not rakhan march twenty eight miles on tuesday and forty two on wednesday horses twenty four hours without water wrote louise in a letter which jeanne received at the end of march and which had been scribbled in blue pencil on pages of his pocket-book torn out and enclosed in a soldier's and seaman's envelope 
we got off the track once and were faced pretty suddenly with the real meaning of waterless desert when a few hours may put an end to a whole party big or small pretty well cooked when we arrived but somebody luckily had a flask of brandy which was mixed with some stinking water and devoured and we slept as we could in a hastily constructed sariba this is a burning rocky bush desert when we are all collected i expect some of us will be sent to berbera about a hundred and twenty miles through dense bush and it is believed no water but think of me slowly slowly trekking towards you and when i get home my genie dear meet me oh meet me with a brimming bucket of fresh sparkling ice-cold water from the mountain stream of coedithel for here it is sometimes green and sometimes grey but always loathsome to taste and smell i am very well my darling little jeanette and only just miss enjoying myself but of course it's rather a bore to be always fighting the water trouble instead of the mullah moved our pitch yesterday the camping ground is a stony glaring treeless place and the heat by day is very great the ground gets red hot the walls of our zariba is made of cut thorn bush and branches laced with barbed wire i have a jolly little day shelter here of camel mats but at night it is preferable to be in the open and enjoy all the cool air one can get i am of course glad to have had this little experience and to have seen something of a new country but i cannot help doubting whether god ever made a more uninteresting spot or one less designed for human habitation a later letter in a worn little blue cover that told its own tale and which bore the inscription on active service somaliland no stamps available arrived by the same post and was dated from galcayo i awoke in the cool and dusty night we have lately been afflicted with dust storms and heard a little commotion of some one arriving in the sariba in the light of the full moon i saw a few people moving about which was unusual at one thirty a m then heard a voice announce the arrival of five mail-bags i awoke again at five with the feelings of a child on christmas morning wondering what would be in my stocking do people at home half realize i wonder the desperate eagerness with which one waits and hopes for letters you do at any rate and how i bless you my genie for so faithfully writing i got your letters forwarded from south africa and three later ones all together why on earth should you trouble your dear anxious head over the preachments of ancient servants there can be no possible reason why this poor lame duke of monaghan whom you describe so pathetically or any other man with whom you are acquainted by this time should not call upon you now that you have a house to receive them in i knew his brother at sandhurst lord dermot liscarney one of the best fellows i ever met and a first-class bat and i saw a good deal of him in south africa one way or another also in fact we were rather specially friendly but i had no idea we were in any way related i have sent him a line to-day for he wrote me an awfully nice letter when he heard i was coming here which i was ashamed to say i never answered it was very nice of the old duchess to have asked you to her party don't let all this magnificence turn my little jean into a fine lady or i shan't know her when i do see her i sometimes get into rather a rotten mood as everybody in these circumstances must now and then and feel i'd duck this old show and every hope of promotion i've got in the world for a single glimpse of those i love best jean was jealous for a moment that louise could thus speak in the plural and mention as it were his love for her in the same breath as his affection for uncle roberts and granny morgan and his countless school and army friends it is something quite different apart from all the rest and above it she reflected with a sigh that louise should even seem to see this less clearly than she did i have had a very nice letter from old valentine he seems to tumble to my notions about saving you all the trouble he can and supplying you and me with more oof than we could possibly spend not that money is of any use to me here heavens 
what untold gold one would gladly exchange for a bottle of bass or a single tumbler of fresh ice cold but i will not hark back to the water question of which you must be heartily sick to return to our family lawyer vast sums in excess of my wildest hopes have been placed to my credit at cox's by this kind accommodating old boy who has further taken charge of all papers etc of mine deposited there in accordance with my directions so now in any emergency my genie you have some one to turn to i gather from your letters that you are a little disappointed at the comparative calm with which i appeared to receive the astounding the overwhelming news of our great aunt's munificence but it was next to impossible to convey my breathlessness in my letters and i have likewise been a pauper so long that i am perfectly unable to realize the change only wait till i get home and i am able to prove to myself that it is real by handing over your share to your own safekeeping and playing ducks and drakes with the rest no no i have grown older and wiser and you shall not have to reproach me any more for unjustifiable extravagance still it must be a great agony to you my poor careful genie to reflect what a lot of money the upkeep of your fine house must cost and if you don't have a good time in it i'll never forgive you seriously the relief to me is so great and would have been with a hundredth part of what our kind relative has showered upon us that i catch myself laughing hilariously whenever i remember what has befallen yesterday one of the men gave me an ostrich's egg such a delicious change i made an omelette and seven of us ate heartily of it about equal to twenty hens eggs the men find a good many patrolling i rather hope to shoot a good ostrich or two myself though what i could do with the plumes unless we made panaches of them i don't know still then i might cry with dear cyrano whom you won't read that there is one thing i will present sans un tache quon e entere chedu simon panache god bless you for ever my darling sister the photo of your dear little round face rests ever in my haversack i must go to work jean wrote long long letters in answer to these though she prayed that her brother might be on the way home before they could reach him she made every preparation she could think of for his return but beyond working almost feverishly at her french studies and the arrangement of his room there was not much for her to do mrs dunham now began to refer very frequently to the captain as she preferred to call louise talking of him as though she had known him all her life there'll be a deal to settle when the captain comes home ma'am he'll have to decide whether to keep us old servants or not oh mrs dunham you little know him if you could suppose he would turn you out of the house you have served so long and so faithfully yes ma'am said dunham briefly accepting jean's consolation as well meant but inadequate but it's not so much the gentleman these things depend on as the lady but i should be very sorry if you went mrs dunham it's not you ma'am as i am alluding to said dunham rather pityingly but the captain's lady you must look to see him get married when he comes home to settle down not just yet i hope jean's smile was a very faint one i have not seen him for five years mrs dunham i could not spare him to a wife just yet no ma'am mothers and sisters generally feels that way my own brother married as poor a creature as never was though dead and gone these twenty years poor thing and him too but a young gentleman like the captain ma'am and so handsome and all doesn't get left long miss jane as a rule i suppose not said jean with a sigh if you'd seen an old family die out as i have miss jean you'd welcome the day said dunham solemnly never a word would you hear no more against marriage or its consequences she was too discreet to breathe a word concerning jane's own prospects but the whole household was now agreed that the duke was coming a wooing for he visited ninety nine grosvenor square as punctually as the man who came to wind up the clocks it was dunham who suggested to jean who would not have dared to originate such a proposal that she might with propriety relax the outward signs of mourning for her great-aunt now that three months had elapsed since her demise and appear in white or violet according to her taste 
the love of romance which lurks in almost every spinster's bosom dictated this suggestion of dunham's rather than any forgetfulness of her beloved mistress as hewitt busied himself more reckless of cost than ever in rendering the morning-room a perfect bower of spring blossom that the background of courtship might not be wanting so did the old woman lie awake at night plotting and planning white muslins mauve chiffons and violet velvet as suitable at once to maiden modesty and ducal dignity he is only waiting for her brother to come home she thought and the whole household was of the same mind the irreproachable character of the suitor the poverty of his exchequer the wildness of his brothers all these facts were perfectly well known to the aged and unsuspected guardians of the lonely lady's interests and she was at a loss to account for the daily increasing deference with which she was now treated few of the family secrets of the great are unknown to gentlemen of hewitt's profession and his friend and crony the solemn major-domo of the duchess's house in park lane was as well aware as hewitt himself how often his grace went to tea at number ninety nine grosvenor square but that his grace was loved and his grace's mother was heartily disliked by her household the news would assuredly through her maid have come to the august ears of the duchess but as it was there was not a scullion in the ducal establishment who would have thwarted the duke's pleasure to please his mamma and denis pursued his tranquil way without a suspicion of the interest with which his comings and goings were regarded he met jean walking in the park on a sunny afternoon in early april as he was passing grosvenor gate and wondering whether it was too soon to call upon her again for the first time he turned and walked with her dunham fell behind respectfully devoting her attention to the breathless waddling yorkshire terrier and congratulating himself that her young lady was wearing her new white gown jean's dress was simple enough but the duke had never seen her hitherto in anything approaching fashionable attire and much as he had appreciated her simplicity the fact that a pretty woman is prettier than she is well dressed came home to him rather forcibly the white cloth gown fitted her full slender figure closely and she wore violets at her pretty white throat and in her shady black hat i am very glad to meet you cousin denise for i have had a letter from the duchess and i want to ask you about it now the duchess was down at challon's sleigh at this moment and denise was keeping house in park lane by himself so that this intelligence startled him very much jean explained it is a very kind letter asking me to go and stay with her for easter and i think it must be because louis knew your brother lord dermot this carney at sandhurst for louis said in his last letter that he had written to him do you think i ought to go she wondered why he was so slow to answer he was looking away from her when his reply came in words even more carefully measured than usual there can be no possible reason why you should not go but shall you be there she asked wistfully i should be afraid to go if you were not there even with you to help me i am afraid i might make many mistakes and do ridiculous things without meaning to the duke's face cleared and he spoke with more boyish heartiness than was his wont of course i shall be there and you could not be ridiculous if you tried but oughtn't i just to explain to the duchess that i was brought up in a farmhouse so that she should know what to expect said scrupulous jean after all i have never stayed anywhere in my life except in penny woon rectory when it was too wet to go backwards and forwards to coed it hell and i know that that would not be at all the same kind of life you can tell her when you get there if you like and if the opportunity arises but there is not the slightest necessity for doing so and i should say nothing about it in my letter and simply write an ordinary note of acceptance but i don't know even how to write an ordinary note of acceptance i thought you would help me she said ingeniously he looked at his watch then we ought to go and do it at once if we are to catch the country post they walked slowly down upper grosvenor street jean considerately moderating her pace to suit the halting footsteps of her companion dunham followed them solemnly 
a model of discreet chaperonage keeping close to her young lady's heels and faithfully leading miss marney's little dog the invitation had come about in the simplest manner through the letter which louise had written to lord dermot and exactly as jean had surmised dermot was his mother's favourite son and his lightest suggestions met with more attention than his elder brother's ceremonious requests thus although the duchess had demurred when denise had asked her to leave a card at ninety nine grosvenor square on a young lady whom he declared to be a relative and made a favour of promising eventually to do as he wished in the matter she yet dispatched an easter invitation to jean without raising any difficulties at all on receiving her son dermot's laconic explanation i have heard from a pal of mine an awfully decent fellow named de courset it appears he is a connection of ours his sister came to one of the monaghan's musical shows he says i suppose you know her i am afraid i don't remember her my dear boy said the duchess shaking her head you know what shoals of people denise makes me ask to his concerts well she lives in grosvenor square his ship appears to have come in an old aunt has left him all her money i believe he has nobody but this sister belonging to him grosvenor square said the duchess oh then i do remember for it was at our own old house that denise insisted on my leaving a card yes he met her at the wellers and found out she was connected somehow the whole incident of jean's call upon mrs weller or as much of it as she had witnessed together with the subsequent introduction of jean to herself had long ago vanished from the mind of the duchess well i wish you'd ask her down to chalonsley mother it would save my having to go and call i've no use for calls and i know the poor chap would like it he's one of the most decent fellows i ever met said dermot repeating the highest terms of praise his vocabulary contained one of my very best pals i'd no idea he was a cousin cousin nonsense said the duchess i suppose they are related to old miss marney who bought the house from us she was a distant cousin i believe a most disagreeable woman very stuck up but enormously rich i only met her once and i took a dislike to her instantly your poor father wanted me to go and see her i remember but nothing would have induced me to set foot in the house again at that time i got it into my head it was an unlucky house everything went wrong in it the old duke left every penny he could away from your father you nearly died of the measles and it all culminated in your brother's accident i ain't superstitious except perhaps about racing said dermot if miss marney left this young man her money as well as the house said the duchess pursuing another train of thought he must be uncommonly wealthy i dare say said dermot and he has only this one sister so he says she must be pretty sick over this somaliland business it looks rotten i hope he'll get safe through poor chap said dermot i'm afraid it's not much of a picnic though by all accounts is he out there said the duchess i'll ask her down for easter what did you say was her name End of chapter fifteen Chapter Sixteen of the Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paige Alcasim, Dallas, Texas. The Lonely Lady of Grosvenor Square by Mrs. Henry de Le Pasteur. Chapter Sixteen, The Duchess. The afternoon sunshine brightened the dead moor, and the golden gorse blazed against a deep blue April sky and scudding, dazzling white clouds. The hedgerows were putting forth young leaves, and the baby oaks hardly yet uncrumpling faint yellow foliage above the clumps of primroses and the patches of blue violets which here and there lightened the dry banks. The ducal carriage skirted the open moorland on the one side, and the tall hedgerow on the other, and Joan, seated alone within it, drank the fresh delicious air through the open window dunham followed decorously in a fly with the luggage she had smiled outright for the first time since her lady's death when joan had communicated to her the fact of the invitation a small difficult sour smile but still a smile of secret pleasure and triumph 
though her immediate comment had sounded to joan extremely irrelevant i dare say william will take care of the little dog i wouldn't trust hewitt his memory is that unreliable nowadays why mrs dunham what can my invitation have to do with a little dog we can't take him ma'am i shouldn't advise it some people are very fidgety about having dogs on a visit do you mean were you thinking of coming with me said joan with a sinking heart of course it's as you wish ma'am if you would prefer another maid i have nothing to say said dunham stiffly i never thought of such a thing must i take a maid of course if any one comes it must be you said joan much flurried but the duchess says nothing about it in her letter she referred anxiously to the scrawled and coroneted sheet of note-paper how should her grace mention such a thing ma'am said dunham in withering tones it would be as much a matter of course to her to take a maid as a brush and comb but it's not much as you allow me to do for you miss jane and of course i am getting old oh mrs dunham don't cried her simple lady almost in tears you know very well i have never been used to maids why should we pretend otherwise just you and me i have always done everything for myself it's not that i don't value and respect you you know it isn't her voice faltered though i make many mistakes you'll make far less ma'am begging your pardon with me on the watch said dunham softening no i can't see as you make many neither only you're that doubtful of yourself but it's no novelty for me to stay in big houses ma'am for when miss marney was young she was always a-visiting about and took a footman with her besides a maid as a matter of course if you won't think it a liberty miss jane i could very well put you in the way of a lot of little things as you could hardly be expected to know of yourself as one might say of course i should be only very grateful to you if you would said joan and she thought that the increased consideration which dunham now displayed towards her denoted that the old woman was growing fond of her at last with mrs dunham to watch upstairs and cousin dennis downstairs she reflected i should think i can hardly go much amiss after all nevertheless she was not a little anxious as the carriage turned into the park here the rolling slopes of emerald green alternating with the bare brown patches of shaven brocken were crowned with great spreading oaks and giant elms casting long shadows across the turf the white road gleamed in the sunshine the deep waters of a lake lay still and glassy reflecting newly leaved bushes and motionless dead stems o oh, earth how beautiful and how silent thought little joan for here it was the overcrowded and noisy city that seemed to her remote and dreamlike the silence ended as the carriage drew up before the house of which the main entrance rather curiously was at the back within view of extensive stables and kennels and a newly built red-tiled tennis court joan was now ushered round tall spanish leather screens which sheltered the entrance to the outer vestibule into an immense oak-panelled hall where a tea-table was drawn up before a huge fire of burning logs various people were seated around talking and laughing as it seemed at the top of their voices and several large boarhounds were lying or standing about in picturesque attitudes the duchess was so unlike the fashionable velvet-clad long-trained personage of jeanne's recollection that she hardly recognized her hostess who advanced to meet her with outstretched hands and a very kind smile of welcome she now wore a short and scanty skirt of battered mud-splashed tweed that barely reached her ankles a loose open baggy coat of the same material which caused her rotund figure to look perfectly shapeless and a knitted tam o' shanter perched on her gray hair above her ruddy healthy countenance the rector's wife would never have been seen in such a gown said poor jean afterwards describing the appearance of the duchess to dunham don't you mind thinking of the rector's wife advised the cautious dunham forget her and all her ways watch her grace ma'am or since her grace is a bit eccentric watch the other ladies here the fashions is changed no doubt since me and my poor lady stayed about but what they does is right some were dressed like the duchess and some in beautiful long flowing robes of lace and pale colours like evening dresses only not cut low and one or two in riding habits 
said poor Jean, hopelessly confused. And one or two of the gentlemen in boots and breeches. They'll have come in from hunting and taken a cup of tea before going to change, said Dunham. And the ones in their tea gowns has changed. And the others very like been walking late. I wish I had thought to get you a tea gown, but it seemed to me you was too young, said the anxious old woman. But I'll pick up all I can in the room, ma'am, you may depend. Jeanne knew not what the room might be, but she placed implicit reliance on her faithful attendant. The Duchess introduced Jean to the three ladies and the two dogs nearest the tea-table, and then said, "'I believe you know my son,' in her loud and cheerful voice, but with very little idea, as Dennis shook hands with her visitor, how very well acquainted they were. "'Where's Dermot? It is Dermot who knows your brother so well. But he shall take you into dinner to-night.' said the duchess by the by i hope you have good news of your brother he's in somaliland isn't he and the duchess turned her attention to somebody else without waiting for jeanne's answer the tea was bitter with long standing and the butter toast so cold that old granny morgan would have thrown it into the fire before presenting it to a guest but jeanne reflected that great ladies cannot be expected to understand such details and decided as she ate and drank in the utmost alarm everything that was set before her that the tale she had heard of the carelessness of servants in large houses must be only too true having finished her tea and scorched the side of her face next to the roaring log fire to a perfect crimson hue she was invited to inspect her room and the duchess led her thither herself with great kindness of manner, talking all the time in her loud, authoritative gabble, and never waiting for an answer, a habit which occasionally relieved her hearers of embarrassment, for her questions were often inconvenient. "'So you live all by yourself in your great house. You must be very dull, but I dare say you have plenty of visitors.' Here Jeanne would fain to have told her that the Duke of Monaghan was her only visitor, but the duchess gave her no time and she was too frightened to interrupt it was always on my conscience that i never visited upon your aunt as my dear duke wished me to do thus she alluded to her departed husband but you know my son's accident which happened there made me declare that i would never enter that house again so you mustn't think it unfriendly if i never do the resolution was taken you see before you were born or thought of why you can't be twenty jeanne tried to interpolate a correct statement of her age but the duchess had flown to another subject as her custom was pursuing her own train of thought undisturbed i suppose you have a companion companions are great bores i had one for a time but she had neuralgia so badly i was glad to see the last of her it was quite depressing here the duchess laughed heartily whenever i wanted her i was always told that she had just taken antipyrin and of course you know one must not stir until the effects of that have passed off so bad for the heart i hope you never drug yourself however i am told every one does nowadays i never touch anything of the kind here is your room now do make yourself quite comfortable and at home and look upon me as a mother all the time you're here my dear for i'm very fond of chaperoning girls never having had daughters of my own jeanne was quite astonished at so much kindness but before she had time to utter her gratitude the great lady was already speeding away down the passage calling to her favourite boarhound who had followed her upstairs with stately velvet tread the bark of the duchess it was always said was worse than her bite but she barked so loud and so long that a bite might have been more easily endured thus though she was in no sense a bad-hearted woman but on the contrary a very kind one she was unpopular among her father's people and on her own estate where her kindnesses were received so thanklessly that she might be almost excused for forming a poor opinion of her tenant's capacity for gratitude but a sharp tongue may inflict wounds that cod liver oil chicken broth and port wine cannot cure nor do coals and blankets necessarily warm hearts chilled and offended by fault-finding carried to excess so that whilst her sons and more especially lord dermot who was to inherit her property were exceedingly popular at shallonsleigh their mother who had been born and bred there was at once disliked and feared to an extent of which she was happily very little aware 
Dunham had paused in her unpacking, and made her old-fashioned curtsy as Her Grace entered the apartment, receiving a good-natured nod in reply, and the Duchess was in high good humour as she stumped away to her own rooms. She hated smart, self-assertive young ladies and pert, independent maids, but Jeanne's maid was ancient and respectable to such a degree that her mere appearance was a voucher for her mistress, and Jeanne herself was timid and gentle as could be wished while she evidently preferred listening to her elders to talking herself. The Duchess asked no more of a young woman than that she should be respectable, retiring, and rich, and she decided that Jeanne possessed all these recommendations to her favor. She questioned her son regarding the riches to make sure, but as she answered her own questions, the Duke did not feel it incumbent upon him to correct her, though he knew very well that if his mother discovered later that she was wrong in any of her assumptions, she would blame him for her mistake. "'Oh, Mrs. Dunham, have you ever seen a prettier room?' cried Joan, the moment she was left alone with her maid. "'Do yes, ma'am, but I wish you could remember to call me plain Dunham, and be done with it. I'm sure I don't know what her grace would think to hear you.' "'I will, I will indeed, Dunham,' said Joan, obedient, though crestfallen. Our spare rooms at Orset were far finer than this, though, of course, you being an unmarried lady wouldn't be given one of the best. Still, one can't keep London bedrooms fresh and sweet and lavender-scented like this, and I could almost think myself back at the old place, said Dunham, sighing as she looked round the pleasant, spacious country bedroom, with its chintz curtain four-poster, white dressed in chimney ornaments, and the fresh daffodils on the muslin-draped toilet table. The big mullioned windows looked on to a stretch of wild park over which a herd of deer was quietly moving, and through the bare branches of distant woodlands blue hills were faintly to be discerned. "'It is so peaceful and so beautiful,' Jeanne said. She leaned out of the open window to enjoy the last long rays of the afternoon sunshine and cool her hot cheeks, and her thoughts flew to the burning desert which held her brother captive, far from this fresh and fragrant English country. Louis had always loved the springtime, and his letters from India and from Africa had yearly breathed forth his longings and his regrets. "'Oh, God, send him safely back to me,' prayed little Jeanne. "'But I mustn't think of him now, or I shall cry, and he would want me to look my best and do him honor." A servant presently brought a tray full of sprays of hothouse flowers to the door, and Joan chose some heliotrope and maidenhair fern to wear in her white gown. "'Can't I help you, Mrs.—I mean, Dunham?' she ventured to say, as the old woman folded and unfolded and sorted and arranged the clothes of her own choosing with heartfelt pride. "'No, Miss Jane, that is the one thing you mustn't do. You should be lying down on the sofa, ma'am, and reading a book.' or taking a doze and getting yourself as fresh as you can to look well when you're dressed. That's what ladies ought to do at this hour. But I'm not tired. You will be, ma'am, for they'll sit up hours later than you're accustomed to. Dinner at half-past eight, and they seldom sits down, I hear, until nearly nine. And there you'll have to be, smiling away as if you never wanted to go to bed again, Dunham anxiously instructed her. "'Not to mention that you'd be out of my way on the sofa, ma'am.' Jeanne obediently reposed herself upon the sofa, in preparation for being tired presently, but the interval between the dressing gong and the dinner hour being rather shorter than Dunham expected, she was obliged in the end to hurry over her toilet, and only just missed being late after all. As she went downstairs, she endeavored to sustain her failing courage by dwelling upon reflections calculated to allay nervousness and inspire heroism. One can only live a minute at a time, a minute at a time. I have but to sit still and watch what other people do. It is not my dinner this time, thank heaven. I got over my first interview with the Duchess very well. Ce n'est que la première pas qui coûte. Jeanne was proud of her French, and this quotation brought her triumphantly to the first broad landing which was decked with hothouse plants and hung with frowning portraits of ducal ancestors. My frock is like a dream, but I cannot think it is I inside it. Oh, that I may not disgrace it by my behavior! I cannot remember the names of any of the people I was introduced to, but Cousin Dennis said I must not repeat people's names when I am talking to them, so perhaps they will not find out I have forgotten. 
Jean-Marie Chalette de Cosset, is this being worthy of your forefathers? Would Anne-Marie Charmonesse, Comtesse de Lonsigne, Chapitre Noble de Bourbourg, have gone to the guillotine shaking at the knees like this? This outburst of noble indignation brought her to the foot of the grand staircase, where a liveried giant, in powder and knee breeches, stood in the now deserted hall and affably indicated the suite of anterooms which led to the saloon where the party was assembled worst come to worst thought jeanne in desperation i can but leave the house early to-morrow morning before any one is up and with this last consoling reflection she entered the drawing-room she looked so much younger than her actual age that her very apparent shyness was more becoming than awkward and evoked fresh approval from the duchess who as soon as she espied through her glasses the timid entry of jeanne made haste to introduce her son dermot who was to take his friend's sister into dinner i dare say i shall have cousin denis on the other side and i must not forget that this is louis's friend thought jeanne faintly as she took the tall young man's proffered arm but as she was the least important person in the room she found herself almost at the other end of the long table from the duke of whose fair head she caught only occasional glimpses across the bowers of spring blossom and the massive gold plate with which the festive board was laden but dermot whose native shyness was scarcely less overpowering than her own though he had plenty of experience to counterbalance it spoke of louis and the ice was not only broken but actually thawed in a moment her bright little face with its fresh red bloom of lip and cheek and its long lashed brown eyes beautiful in shape and soft in expression was turned towards her partner constantly she listened with eager delight to the anecdotes of louis which pleased with a success he seldom attained as a raconteur the young man contrived to fish up from the depths of his memory he knew louis well had shared more than one scrape with him but concerning this he was prudently silent and played cricket with him been in action with him and they were together in hospital at kimberley but he never told me he had been in hospital said jeanne lord bless you we were in and out like rabbits probably forgot to mention it said the diplomatic dermont no it was that he was afraid to make me anxious jeanne said with loyal admiration but she did not like to think louis could keep even so small a secret as this from her he promised to tell me everything she thought i was in batting with him once at sandhurst when he took his century against some local team or other said dermot omitting to mention his own almost equally fine performance on the same occasion lord how he made me run <laughs> he nearly killed me i'm not so thin as he is and he laughed all over his broad fair face a laugh so good-natured and so mirthful that jean joined in it without knowing why but he was not obliged to spend more time than he liked in making conversation for jeanne was willing to talk of her brother as she had been to listen to lord dermot's reminiscences of louis so that he was enabled to devote himself for long periods entirely to his dinner which he did with great energy and appetite the gentleman on jeanne's other side was afforded an excellent view of a thick knob of brown hair and a very white and dimpled neck and shoulder but he scarcely saw even the profile of his pretty neighbour and no opportunity of addressing her was granted to him was it all right did i do well she asked the duke anxiously after dinner perfectly he said encouragingly i hope you talked a little to mr jermyn who sat next to you he is such an interesting man and a great friend of my own i carefully never spoke to him said poor jeanne in horror i thought i must not speak to anybody until i was introduced your neighbor at dinner is an exception said the duke laughing at her dismay never mind you can make it up to-morrow mr corset come and play billiard fives cried lord dermot interrupting unless you are a bridger are you a bridger as soon as she had learnt what was meant by the term jeanne assured him earnestly that she was not and with a bright look of apology at dennis for how was it possible to refuse the friend of louis she went off with lord dermot and two or three of the younger members of the party to be initiated into the mysteries of billiard fives the duke walked to the piano in the now brilliantly lighted hall and began to improvise and a young lady who meant to marry him if she could sat within his view in a becoming attitude and listened with rapt attention at the close of each movement she hoped he would leave off playing and come talk to her 
but it invariably glided into another, until at last she gave up in despair and went away, not daring to interrupt him, for it was known that to be interrupted when he was making music was the one thing which ruffled the duke's even temper. His improvisations ended with a crash when Jean returned from the billiard-room with the rest of the players, all talking and laughing tumultuously. She came straight to the piano, with flushed cheeks and brilliant eyes, smiling and joyous. "'Oh, Cousin Dennis, it was so delightful. I wish you had come. We had so much fun. What have you done to your hand?' "'It is only a little bruise.' She held out a fair arm that shone through the veiling of white gauze, and showed him a blue mark on her wrist. "'Lord Dermot would tie a handkerchief round it, but it is nothing at all.' Dermot came and stood beside her, towering over her, and smiling fatuously as he pulled at the flaxen down which shaded his upper lip. "'Billiard fives can be an abominably rough game. You should have taken better care of her,' said Dennis, and the brother's glances met over Jean's unconscious bent brown head as she examined her bruise. The one pair of blue eyes was angry, the other astonished." Dermot noted the unusual sternness of the duke's low voice, and observed the pallor of his face, and suddenly, recalling Jean's innocent references to his brother's visits in Grosvenor Square, a light broke in upon his mind. "'It doesn't hurt a bit, you know,' said Jean, looking into the duke's face. "'And we won, which was all that mattered.' The Duchess remarked the group at the piano as she presently entered the hall, in the best of spirits, for she had won five shillings on the evening and she smiled her most agreeable smile as the work of distributing the flat candles began, distinguishing Jean with a special notice as the ladies proceeded to mount the grand staircase and bidding her good-night at her own door. "'It is all gone off very well indeed, Dunham,' said Jean, greeting the old woman, who awaited her by the blazing fire in her own room. "'And I don't think I ever enjoyed myself so much in my life.' "'I'm sure I'm very glad to hear it, ma'am.' said Dunham affably. "'And you looked very well, Miss Jane, for me and some of the other maids were standing up there in the dark gallery and peeping down at you all in the hall when you came out of dinner. You should not have waited up for me. I could have managed very well for myself.' "'I hope I know my work better than that, am, though returning you many thanks for the kind thought,' said Dunham. But her tone was still more deferential, for had she not heard her young lady requested to look upon her grace as a mother? and was it for her to be finding fault with a possible future duchess? What had seemed like rustic ignorance on the part of Jean would soon appear a mere gracious consideration for her inferiors, and Dunham prepared herself to regard with respectful indulgence the eccentricities of one who found favour in the eyes of a duke. In the meantime, Lord Dermot and his elder brother found space and opportunity for a few words together, and alone. "'I only ask for fair play, Dermot,' If you are in earnest, you have as much right as I. If not, for God's sakes, let her alone, said the Duke, with white lips. The poor old chap must be balmy, absolutely balmy, to go on like this, thought his astonished brother, but aloud he said, in much the same soothing tones he would have adopted towards a lunatic. My dear old fellow, don't be an ass. I never set eyes on the girl before the whole course of my existence. I ask you, is it likely— "'There is such a thing as love at first sight,' said the Duke sternly. Dermot dared not smile. "'To be sure there is,' he said good-humouredly. "'But I solemnly swear—' "'Don't,' said the Duke, who had heard many such assertions on other subjects from the same lips, and was no longer impressed. "'I only spoke out like this, Dermot,' he said simply, "'because it appears to me it would be foolish to throw away my own happiness, and perhaps—' Who knows, in a lower tone, hers, for want of a word between you and me, who have always more or less understood each other. It would be simply Tommy Rot, said Dermot, translating the Duke's measured words into the emphatic language best understood of himself, and he helped himself with emotion to his third whiskey and soda since dinner. I don't think you are the fellow to let a few days idle. I hate the word flirtation come between you and me it wouldn't be worth it said the duke but she's very young or at least she's very inexperienced which comes to the same thing and and but mind dermot i'm not asking any kind of sacrifice from you if 
if it's with you as it is with me, in that case, we'll shake hands over it and let the best man win. But my dear old chap, it isn't, almost shouted Dermot. I give you my word, such an idea never even entered my head. I'll leave the house tomorrow morning, if you wish, with the greatest pleasure in life. No, no. Well, anyway, here's luck to your wooing, said Dermot, with enthusiasm born of whiskey. Have you thought what our parent will say when she gets wind of it? I don't mean her to get wind of it until it's settled one way or the other. But she will. Trust her for nosing it out. The more especially if you give yourself away as you have done to-night, thought Dermot but this to himself. There is nothing for her to find out. Miss de Corset herself has no suspicion of my feelings, so naturally no one else has, said the infatuated young man, innocently. Well, well, said Dermot, as gravely as he could. It's I who am responsible for her coming here, so it is I who will be blamed if the match isn't approved. I'm sure I don't care. Her grace can say very little to me that she hasn't said before, if it comes to that. A disreputable, idle, extravagant, thoughtless spendthrift, careless of the best interests of the family, etc. Dermot, said his brother nervously, I wish you would not speak as though it were a certainty. I haven't even asked her yet, and you forget that my personal disadvantages. Bosh, said Dermot, let me tell you that if you think she'd marry me for any reason except— Dermot concealed a smile. Poor Dennis, he thought. I suppose they're always like that. However, in this case, perhaps his game leg makes him extra funky. What's the good of all this shilly-shallying? Still, if by any chance she did take it into her head to refuse him, I believe he'd go clean off his chump. This reflection caused him to ply his brother with excellent disinterested counsel. Look here, Dennis, he said gravely. I advise you— and you know I've had lots of experience in these matters, interpolated the Lothario of twenty-four. I advise you to go straight ahead and, and take her by storm, don't you know? There ain't any reason on earth why she shouldn't be fond of you, he said awkwardly. Only, as she's an uncommonly pretty girl, I'd be hanged if she isn't. He finished the whiskey and soda. While you're thinking about it and mooning over your music and all that— some other fellow will cut in and carry her off under your nose if you don't take care i was always a bit of a muff wasn't i dermot said the duke in a tone of somewhat melancholy raillery not the sort of fellow to take anything by storm perhaps dermot in his heart rather agreed that his eldest brother was a bit of a muff for he was not sufficiently cultivated himself to appreciate the cultivation of dennis and occasionally mistook the gentleness and gravity born of suffering and solitude, for want of manliness. But he was at once too good-natured and too fond of Dennis, to have ever given utterance to his opinion, and he had no idea that the Duke had divined it. He clapped his brother encouragingly upon the shoulder, and expressed both his sympathy and his affection as tersely as possible, in the emphatic utterance of his favorite monosyllable. Rot! End of chapter 16《ハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーユーハッピーバースデートゥーbut such periods are not to be measured by the clock. A vague but perfect happiness, enjoyed almost unconsciously at the time, yet looked back upon afterwards with wonder and envy. Jeanne did not pause to ask herself why the days at Chelinsley were so much happier than any other days her life had ever known, nor why the spring season, always a time of rejoicing, should this year be so righteously glad as to fill her heart with actual ecstasy as she walked in the sunshine beneath a cloudless April sky, and gathered the scented white violets and the yellow daffodils growing by the thousands in the fields. She tried her hand at golf under the Duke's tuition, and, being blessed with the luck that usually attends beginners, 
believed that she could play the game very fairly. She was driven to the meet in the duke's dog-cart, and with great wonder and admiration beheld the duchess on her colossal steed, looking as trim as it was possible for a lady weighing fourteen stone to look in her close-fitting habit. She sat with the duke in the new tennis court, and watched vigorous encounters between Dermot and Brian, evenly matched in the royal game, equally tall, active, and muscular, and she wondered that Cousin Dennis should be so keenly and breathlessly interested as a mere looker-on. She marveled at the luxury of the stables, the number of the horses, the extensiveness of the kennels, and the perfection of the model farms on the estate, which appealed strongly to her own orderly instincts and practical experience. The Duchess was fond of an outdoor life. When she was at home in the country, she discarded her fine clothes, her curled white front, and her long-handled glasses, and tramped about the grounds in all weathers, wearing a short tweed skirt, a billycock perched on her own gray hair, and a pair of spectacles which enabled her to see where she was going. She carried always a stout walking stick, and was generally followed by half a dozen dogs besides her favorite boarhounds. She visited cottages, inspected the home farm, and examined the timber with untiring interest and energy. But it was new to her to find a female companion who was as tireless as herself and a great deal more active, and who had an even more practical knowledge of subjects connected with stock, cider-making, and dairy work. She found fault, in her usual candid manner, with Schoen's too elegant walking attire, and presented one of her own tweed skirts to her visitor, to Dunham's horror, which Schoen gratefully accepted, as she did all the advice bestowed upon her by the Duchess, who was highly delighted by such docility. Her fear of the Duchess vanished during the expedition she made with her, tramping up steep, red, muddy roads, through coppices carpeted with primroses, down narrow, stony lanes, and over springing mossy turf. They became nearly intimate. The Duchess, to be sure, monopolized the chief part of the conversation, but the country was hilly, and the great lady was stout. Going uphill, Joan had it all her own way. Thus her grace learnt the history of the French pedigree, which bored her excessively, and, incidentally, the generous intentions of Louis, which she took breath to assure Joan, panting, were exactly what every one in the world would expect of him, and which could not consequently be thwarted, and this latter information interested her so much that she redoubled her kindness to her visitor, and pressed her to prolong her stay. Habit, doubtless, endures human beings to all kinds of changes, but more swiftly to surroundings of luxury than of hardship. Jeanne soon learnt to go into dinner without trembling, and to order her own breakfast quite fearlessly every morning from the menu handed to her as she entered the great dining-room, where every guest who breakfasted downstairs had his or her separate service and special dish to order. She retracted her hasty judgment of the bad management of large establishments as she gained experience in the excellence of cuisine and the perfect attention of the noiseless and well-trained servants. Her simplicity saved her from the mortifications and difficulties that might have beset a lonely lady with a little more knowledge of the world, who found herself suddenly included in a large and fashionable party assembled for Easter in a country house but illusions that such a one might be striving to follow and understand passed over her head with perfect innocuousness, and here ignorance was bliss indeed. It did not concern her for a moment that she could not join in the conversation when it turned on racing, as it often did, or on bridge, or on motoring, or the latest doings of the best-known people in the land. She knew as much about politics as about polo, and was perfectly contented to sit in her corner and listen whilst others talked or to withdraw her mind altogether from her surroundings and dream of louis her modesty attracted the men of the party and mollified the women had the duke and his mother monopolized her less she might have made many friends as it was she saw the departure of most of the easter guests without any particular feelings of regret and rather rejoiced at the diminished numbers of the party which led to a certain increase of intimacy among those who remained Lord Dermot had turned his attentions, always inclined to be exclusive, to the young lady who had intended, if she could, to marry the duke, and as she prudently reflected that, after all, the younger brother would be the richer man of the two, she met his advances, as it seemed to the onlookers, rather more than halfway, 
which resulted in a flirtation so very ardent and conspicuous that the duchess hailed the return of her second son to his duties at windsor with great relief their devotion was so exaggerated that it excited open smiles and joan overhearing fragments of a conversation between two ladies who were intimate with one another could not be ignorant of the subject to which they alluded will it come to anything do you think good heavens no he never stays in the same house a week without almost becoming engaged he only just fled in time then i never saw any one so determined as she she has met her match said the first lady shaking her head he will disappear to shoot lions or something worse come to the worst they generally go to the rocky mountains in cases of extremity said the other joan listened with indignation but it was being gradually borne in upon her simple mind that size strength and comeliness of person are not the only desirable qualities in mankind and that the duke suffered less than she could have supposed possible by comparison with his brothers lord dermot loud and cheerful ruddy and healthful was obviously to the merest looker-on careless of everything in the world but his own pleasure lustily ready to hunt to shoot or to make love with equal zest and young as he was already dependent on constant fillips of whisky lord brian with an equally fine physique and the same saxon fairness was at once heavier of build and duller of intellect than his elder and appeared to exist for the sole purpose of getting from one place to another as quickly as he possibly could for he dreamt thought and spoke of nothing but motoring but at least they are brave thought joan wistfully for they both went to south africa to fight for their country but she could not help feeling that when she had said that she had said all she blushed at the memory of her earlier feelings for cousin dennis of her kindly pity not unmixed with contempt for his inferiority in appearance and strength to her idolized brother was it possible that the difference of the setting in which she now beheld him had helped to increase her respect for the duke so that she now regarded him with something very like reverence mingled with her cousinly affection jeanne blushed again and with shame at the very suspicion yet human nature is undeniably subject to the influence of surroundings the quiet lame young man whose fair complexion was liable to such unfortunate variations of colour whose unassuming manners had caused her to forget her natural timidity and who never asserted his own opinions nor contradicted those of other people nor expressed strong likes and dislikes had seemed to joan accustomed to the more vigorous and less well-governed personality of louis a very ordinary individual indeed but the duke seated at the head of that great banqueting table with its double row of well-bred well-dressed guests and its burden of hot-house blossoms and gold plate and wax lights the duke limping through the spacious hall giving quiet orders in his low voice to bowing and deferential servants of twice his own size as a matter of course the duke riding through the deer park on his splendid chestnut horse in short the duke at home the head of a great house and treated universally with respect as well as affection by those who had known him from childhood could no longer be regarded by a little country maiden as such a very unimportant young man his lameness and his delicacy notwithstanding and perhaps joan would hardly have been human had she not come to look upon him in a totally new light high or low indoors or out there's not a living soul but has a good word for him reported dunham thus doubtless summarizing the information she had been able to glean in the room he spent the most of his money they say on the poor irish tenants but yet he always seems to have something to spare twas he has come to the vicar's help here and with the working man's club as her grace wouldn't have put her hand in her pocket for and he has built the tennis court for his brothers and nobody they says from his childhood up has ever heard a rough word from him for all he suffered from his poor back and her grace's tantrums the duchess although in no way gifted by any especial quickness of perception was yet being a woman and a mother enabled to divine the sentiments in which dennis regarded her young visitor before joan had been twenty-four hours under her roof only her real anxiety to see her eldest son married could have kept her nimble tongue from allusion to the subject but though a great talker she could be silent when her own interests or her children's were at stake and she perceived joan's unconsciousness with something like awe realizing the simplicity which it denoted 
the duchess knew very well that the unconsciousness was real and not assumed no woman can be deceived on such a point by another and she felt almost a maternal tenderness towards the girl as she realized it i have always wished for a daughter she thought and here for a wonder is one who would suit me down to the ground no modern anaemic young woman all nerves and excitement but a nice quiet gentle creature come of a healthy agricultural stock with an historic name as it appears into the bargain and best of all the prospect of a really suitable marriage dot for mr valentine had told dunham and dunham had told her grace's maid who had in turn informed the duchess of captain de corset's openly declared intention of sharing his unexpected inheritance with his twin sister no doubt thought her grace he would be advised to do nothing quite so quixotic when the time came but her favourite inquiry of how much in the right quarters had elicited the gratifying information that the late miss marney's gross estate had been valued at three hundred and sixty thousand pounds it would go hard with her shown's portion from a young and generous brother who had never before owned a penny in his life and who practically owed his inheritance to his sister should be less than a hundred thousand pounds perhaps even more when young de corset realized the magnificence of the match joan would be making i should be quite satisfied with that thought the duchess surprised at her own moderation quite because she is so exactly the kind of girl i prefer and never hope to find for dennis why can't he make haste and propose to her thank heaven dumont did not take one of his fancies to her no young woman would look at dennis beside dumont the duchess was troubled with no illusions concerning the superiority of mind over muscle and feminine eyes she shall not stir from here until it is all settled but fate was too strong for the duchess jeanne's visit had lasted ten days for she had needed but little pressing to prolong it and she had spent a happy morning wandering in the old walled kitchen gardens with dennis for the duchess who usually claimed her company at that time had some areas of letter writing to occupy her and was busy with her secretary it was a typical april day light showers alternating with brightest sunshine and the breath of spring flowers scented the mild air they walked past beds of wallflowers pale yellow and copper color and deep velvet red and of blue forget-me-nots bordered with stiff little red daisies below sunny red walls where the blossoming peach trees were nailed fanwise through alleys of standard pears and plums and cherry trees white with bloom against a high north wall the camellias flourished heartily bearing the burden of waxen flowers in profusion as though the outdoor climate of the west country were more congenial to them than the hothouses of the north above the wall rose the delicate spires of the young larch plantations newly green and the horse chestnuts just uncrumpling downy leaves and the cuckoo's call sounded far and near i should think you must be fonder of this place than of anything in the world said jeanne no for it is not my home quilmore is far dearer to me solitary as it is it is much wilder and more beautiful than this though alas so much less prosperous and orderly can you not work at it to make it grow prosperous and orderly it is the wish of my heart he said if it could be done when shall you go back asked jeanne simply very soon it depends they took refuge in a greenhouse from a passing shower jeanne stood beside a bank of arums and spiria and madonna lilies which rose among the palms above the lower tier whereon brightly coloured hyacinths and gay tulips were ranged in long rows a light green climber covered the roof and dangled delicate tendrils above their heads the rain pattered upon the glass and splashed through the open doorway and the duke half closed the door they had been together and alone very often but never quite like this shut into this narrow glass kingdom of colour and sweet scent in a twilight of green foliage and falling rain a sudden consciousness touched both man and maiden with that unpremeditated little action of the duke's in closing the door as it were upon the outer world and although they were standing in such close proximity that the white cloth gown was almost touching the grey tweed coat yet neither glanced towards the other the rain ceased as suddenly as it began 
glistening silver drops fell from the cornice to the stone pavement of the entry whilst the sun serenely conquered the last of the purple clouds and shone forth with renewed splendor the duke looked at jeanne's bright face which reflected the glory of the sunlight in the clear transparent red of her cheeks and in her dazzled brown eyes and said to himself with new-born hopefulness not yet but very soon for as she had passed from shyness to perfect confidence in his presence so he was conscious now that her shyness of him was returning once more almost it seemed as though she were beginning at last to understand jean blushed as she met that half tender half mirthful look in his blue eyes and said hurriedly it has stopped raining let us go home now without knowing why and indeed scarcely knowing what she said but as they went their way home over the wet paths wherein the sun reflected itself from a thousand miniature lakes and gleaming pebbles the song of the birds sounded as no concert of the woods had ever sounded to joan's ears before and evoked joyful echoes in her very heart they walked in silence and in silence parted in the great hall thus affording a happy illustration of the proverbial blindness of love for by this time joan was perhaps the only woman in challensley who did not know that she was the probable future duchess of monaghan and dennis the only man who had any doubt as to what her answer would be when he should actually utter the proposal which had so often trembled upon his lips both were content for the moment with that vaguely blissful condition which precedes the declaration of first love and seldom altogether survives it so that instead of coming to an immediate understanding with his companion the duke sought the privacy of his study whilst joan flew upstairs to her own room that she too might be alone with her happy thoughts and her budding hopes and the bewildering tumult of her suddenly awakened heart she did not know as she entered her pleasant room with the gladness of the spring and her hurrying pulses and the brightness of the april sunshine still dazzling her brown eyes that she was leaving her youth upon the threshold and shutting the door upon it for ever she crossed the room humming a song but her song died on her lips as she took up a telegram which lay conspicuously upon the dressing-table o h m s deeply regret telegram received from bahadel reports your brother captain louis de corset missing without doubt killed in action military secretary dunham entered from the communicating room and found joan standing still with the telegram in her hand it came an hour ago said the maid and i brought it up here for you thinking it might be important louis is dead said joan she did not faint nor scream only looked at dunham and presently sat down in the armchair feeling a little sick she heard dunham asking somebody at the door for brandy and thought she laughed in the old woman's face when she returned but it was only a pitiful ashy smile that jean gave how could brandy possibly help her yet when she had obediently swallowed the mixture dunham put authoritatively to her lips she found that it helped her her knees ceased to shake and the mist cleared away and she understood that the telegram was a reality i know now why poor people take to drink when they are miserable she said suddenly to dunham you get strong and you understand but it all seems a long way off and as if it didn't really matter dunham was shocked when joan said this describing what she really felt instead of what she ought to have felt but the effect that she described was so momentary that it was barely worth describing at all i must write to uncle roberts at once she said and went to the writing-table dunham stood watching her not knowing what to do but very sure that somebody must be written to at once and relieved that her young lady should be able to do it joan took one of the strawberry crowned sheets of note-paper and began her letter dear uncle roberts i am sorry to tell you that louis is dead the written words looked to her so absurd that she laughed aloud and dunham became alarmed for her reason you had better send a telegram ma'am or let me and perhaps your good uncle would come to you miss jane for we must go home at once said the poor old woman and she suddenly broke down herself and began to cry pitifully do not cry mrs dunham what are you crying for said joan jealously he was nothing to you End of chapter 17